picture it. 1998. Okay. 14-year-old Indy is staying up real late, like uh-huh. I always do. And I loved late night talk shows. Right. That was a thing I loved as an early teen. So I was watching Letterman, and I think it was like Val Kilmer was on. And for the musical guest, they had the cast of the Broadway revival of Cabaret. I had not really seen any musicals to this point. I was not a musical kid. I mean, I liked like Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and stuff. Right. But that was about the extent of it. Like Broadway musicals. Yeah. So then I saw this. I saw Alan Cumming performing Vilkomen. Oh. And I was like, oh, shit. What? What's this? <laughs> Do I like musicals? And... I guess that makes sense. We'll probably talk about it. This is kind of a, an anti-musical in a lot of ways. It's the musical haters musical, perhaps. And I don't hate musicals, of course, but that was the first time I saw it. So then I went, I think I had to go to the library <laughs> and I got the soundtrack for the original uh-huh. cast because the the revival one, I wasn't out yet. Right. There was no Broadway revival recording. Not yet. And I think maybe I like downloaded stuff on Kazaa or something. Oh Napster, my God, maybe? Napster. I think it was around Lime that time. Wire? I think that was maybe a couple of years later that I got okay. to do that. Because 98, I think it was still pretty new. Internet in the home, honestly. Internet in the home was still like dial-up, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. It was definitely dial-up. But I mean, just having it in your home was a pretty big deal. True. And that's how I discovered Cabaret got real into it and all these years later the kind of the first musical i gave a chance to it's my favorite musical oh i like that story that's fun so that's how i had discovered cabaret and you discovered it just this weekend this week <laughs> so i guess we should get started welcome oh i was gonna say welcome everybody welcome in bienvenue welcome, welcome. <laughs> to ca- to another <laughs> episode of I love this. You should too. I'm your host, the happiest corpse you ever will see, <laughs> Indy Randawa. And with me is Samantha Green Fingernails Randawa. Oh, I should have done green fingernails. You really should. But maybe for Christmas. Maybe for Christmas. I'm trying to avoid Christmas nails because it's still November. When see, when we're... I see green nails, I think Sally Bowles nails. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll have to do some green nails in honor of Sally Bowles. In case this is your first episode of this podcast, we take turns picking movies, making the other person watch them, and then forcing them into discussion and debate. Is that what we do? That was what we were going to do, but then we kind of just chit chat. Yeah. And analyze. And analyze. We got real analytical. Yeah, we have. I feel like I'm better for it. I don't know if it's everything that you wanted it to be. Oh, everything and more. (laughs) But uh, we're doing all musicals this month. Samantha is a big musical lover. I I am am a big film lover. And I think uh, musicals are just as valuable as any other type of art. So I like the good ones. I dislike the bad ones. But Cabaret was my favorite. And so that was my pick. And I got Samantha to watch it for the very first time. And before we get into my opinions on whether it held up, because I'd actually probably only seen this once, and that was 20 years ago. Hmm. Samantha, what are your thoughts on Cabaret? Or as the title suggests, I love this movie. Did you? Um, I loved it. You loved it. It was pretty great. It is pretty great. We like It was a fun time to watch. We were singing the songs after when we weren't watching it. And I feel like that's the mark of a really good show is when it's like kind of stuck in your head all week. And I do feel like I've had some of the songs like just floating through my head on and off. I really, really liked it. I'm really excited to talk about it with you because I feel like you're going to have all sorts of really cool things to teach me about. Oh, I don't know. We'll, <laughs> we'll see. Hopefully I'll have something. Honestly, when we do a lot of these movies, or the ones that I really love, I kind of have essays written, ready to go. Not mm-hmm. ready to go, but I, I pontificate a yeah. lot. I don't think that's going to be the case in this one as much, even though there's so much to talk about. I think we're going to kind of go through it pretty much chronologically, and we'll just chat. I know you're going to want to talk about the songs. Yeah. I'll probably throw in a bunch of stuff too, but uh, based on what you're saying, though... 
I hope we get a chance to see the stage play because I think you would prefer that. Yeah. There are more songs and I think the stuff that perhaps you didn't like as much based on what we've talked about through uh, 200 and I don't know, 40 episodes or whatever we're at, Mm -hmm. that the elements that you didn't like are unique just to the film. Yeah. So the 98 revival is kind of my touchstone for Cabaret. That's how I got in. That's the soundtrack that I own. That's the one I listen to so much and that I love so much. Mm -hmm. I never actually saw this movie until a few years after that, and I haven't seen it since. So I probably saw this when I was like, 20 or so and haven't seen it since and at the time i was not terribly impressed because it just wasn't the version that i loved so much upon this rewatch now it made me do two kind of contradictory things it made me like the musical portion of this one less then that's to say i don't think it's as good of a musical as the stage play, specifically the one that I love so much with Natasha Richardson and Alan Cumming. Mm -hmm. But this is a fantastic movie. Mm -hmm. It's so much better of a movie than I had given it credit for. And I kind of now get why it was so like adored by the Academy and everything like that. Yeah, because this won some some serious awards. It won eight Oscars. Wow. Both Joel Grey and Liza Minnelli won theirs. It's the most Oscars ever won by a movie that did not win Best Picture because it came out in the same year as a little movie called The Godfather. Oh. But Joel Grey beat Al Pacino. Wow. I still think, I don't don't think that's deserved, but uh, I think Al Pacino should have been nominated for Best Actor, but not Best Supporting Actor. And there were three Godfather actors in that category, and I feel like they split the vote of Godfather right. fans, and then Joel Grey kind of swept in. Because he was, like, not in The Godfather. Yeah. Also, Bob Fosse won over Francis Ford Coppola for Best Director. Which oh, wow. I don't know about that either, but <laughs> good, good for him. It's it's fantastic either way. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a big deal, especially because The Godfather is such a huge thing still yeah (laughs) and this was the only musical or first i guess musical to ever be rated x oh right you told me that it was rated x i forgot that x was a rating yeah now other than like jokey like oh it's adult yeah x (laughs) x used to just be the equivalent of our r or nc17 yeah whatever it is but yeah i forgot that things were rated x and that makes it seem so sexy and it is (laughs) it is very sexy yes so we'll break it down. Do you have anything you want to open with? What What is this movie about to you? A cabaret dancer who meets a normal man and considers being with him. But also the Nazis taking over Germany. I think it's a movie about political apathy, first and foremost. I could see that. And I think it's really interesting both um, last week's movie and this week's movie, um, just the different attitudes about the Nazis slowly taking over or quickly taking over, I guess. I'm glad we watched Sound of Music just the other week because I had some criticisms of that movie. It's not my favorite like it is yours. And I said, "It's, it's no cabaret. And it is such a great piece to go side by side because, of course, they deal with very similar subject matter, but they come at it in two incredibly different ways. Yeah. And I always talk about the cinema of the 70s being my my favorite decade because there was this realness, this grittiness, heroes lived in the gray areas, all of that. That's cabaret. Mm-hmm. We talk about like Taxi Driver and the conversation as being the big touchstones of the 70s. But cabaret is the 70s in musical form perfectly. It, it does so much of that, even though it's dealing with things happening in the 30s. It epitomizes so much of the landmarks of 70s cinema. Mm-hmm. So let's go through it. First off, it starts, no big overture, silence. Which is so weird because we totally were like, is it broken? Did we get a bad copy of this? I like, thought my receiver wasn't working. Yeah, it was unnerving. Yes. Way to start this. And that seems very intentional. This movie and the direction, I think, 
goes out of its way to unnerve you. It does a lot of that, a lot of playing with not just sound, but kind of grotesque imagery, and the editing is can be choppy at times to to try to elicit that sort of response from you. Yeah. And it sets it up quite quickly as, I know people always talk about postmodernism and they overuse it, but I think this is kind of a postmodern musical, right? It's taking the pieces that we know of a musical and playing with them, messing with it, and using it kind of as a commentary on the genre even. I feel like calling it like an anti-musical or something would be good because it's not like um like sound of music or any of these musicals that were like really i feel like musicals were happy Mm -hmm. a lot of the time and this is like the opposite of it and um i think it's like a really interesting and i think like you said important piece of musical theater history Yeah, it's definitely a departure. Of course, it's not the first musical to deal with kind of touchy subject Mm -hmm. matter. There there were a a bunch before, but one of the first big ones for sure. And to have so many kind of maybe not the first in each thing, but doing it all and so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting because I feel like musicals weren't written about the people who were singing at the time i guess right like unless you were what um what sally wanted to be an actress you weren't living this glamorous sparkly life you were singing in cabarets and you were singing where you could get stage time and you were basically like just making money to live and it wasn't quite as happy and bubbly as some of the musicals of this time would lead you to believe yeah right away with this one we're well with the silence first of all and then as soon as we see the club we're instantly shown that this isn't going to be one of those musicals that we're used to coming Mm -hmm. off of the 50s and 60s it has that silence this cabaret that we see is kind of shitty looking It, it is there's nothing lavish or glamorous when we have the sound of music having helicopter flyovers yes. in these beautiful mountains singing about the hills are alive. Here we have the shitty cabaret. When we meet Sally, she's the, one of the first things she's talking about is like, oh, when I uh, hook up with random dudes, I prefer to go to their place. And yeah. It's showing you like this. There's no nuns in this. No. One. And it's not glamorous. And we start off with the welcoming song. Yeah. Welcome in, which is great. Yeah, and I I think it's really interesting because I was expecting kind of a flashier look to the club. And then when you look like, oh, these dancers look ill. Yeah, and the like costumes are very clearly just out of thrift stores or like closets. Did you know that? So literally, they are from thrift stores in Germany. Oh, wow. And Joel Grey would talk about how bad his suit smelled. (laughs) Because it was all just like old stuff. Yeah. Not all. The, the majority of it was, though. I kind of figured that. And I think it's really like it's like a nice addition. Because I feel like we were saying as we were watching a little bit today over dinner, I um I think if it was made now, we may lose that effect. Oh, definitely. Right after this, we were all hopped up on Candor and Ebbs. <laughs> so we watched a little Chicago. And right away, I was like, no, it's not... <laughs> as good i get that the songs and everything but the movie of chicago has nothing on the movie of cabaret and it's because of things like that yeah there we go to a jail and everyone looks great everyone's yeah i got it's, fresh curls and like yeah it starts in a cd club so after watching cabaret when people looked like they worked at a cd club yeah everyone is a perfectly sculpted calvin klein model in yeah. the club there and their outfits are beautiful and everything's look brand perfect. new. And yeah, it's it was really interesting um, to see that. And I think it added to the ambiance of what this club is. Yeah. And that's I know I keep uh, drilling down on it whenever there's an opportunity. But that's that was the 70s in cinema. And that's mm. kind of why I loved it. It had that like the cinema verite, but to a new um, that's like r- realism, uh-huh. like true realism that Things look like they should look. The people in this movie look like just people. Yeah. The people in this who are on stage at a club are arguably, and probably so, 
uglier than people who would be ugly people and being made fun of as being ugly in a modern movie. Right. Yeah. I guess we were talking about Chicago. The difference. It's like most people don't know how to do good stage makeup, right? Like it's not something that everyone inherently knows how to do. And these people are clearly just like working with what they have. Mm hmm. And so that's blue eyeshadow and a lot of white face paint and, you know, some red lipstick and you're good to go. And in addition to that realism, it adds like a certain grotesqueness. And I don't want to say like, oh, these people are hideous. And they're, it's quite intentionally yeah. so. They're, they're trying to make this grotesque and unappealing. And we'll get into all the reasons why mm -hmm. as we go. Well, we're still on the first song. We need to get going. <laughs> I love, though, that when he's introducing everyone, it's just like, oh, and from America, Sally Bowles. Yeah. And just she goes right on. Yeah. And we see these other acts, but I wonder what they're doing. I want to see all the acts in this. Yeah. And I wonder if in the stage show you get to see a little bit more of that. Not those ones okay no. okay i think it's a great way to start the musical you get to meet a bunch of people it's like a good um introduction to what this whole world is it, it definitely is it sets you up for what you're going to be expecting in the rest of the movie and what it's going to look like because you see a range of people and various outfits and like you kind of get an idea of what you're in for and you see some of the audience too all of that cross cutting i think is a very important because it's the well, of course it's showing the audience but having the ability to show a cross section of germany and do that a few different yeah. times is important for what they build up to later yeah. on, especially ending with the big mirror finale that we get. And the other unique thing about this, every song in this is a diegetic song, meaning that this could not be a musical. Right. You know, like, is this a musical even? Because usually the hallmark of musicals is that people are just... Singing their emotions. Yeah. Yeah. And the music is coming from somewhere. We don't who know. knows? Like from their emotions, essentially. But there's a band. Yeah. And, or an orchestra, I guess. And uh, yeah, they're, they're only singing f for like when it makes sense in the cabaret show to sing. Yeah. So. So I thought... That that was like, oh, that's so different that here they're not just singing their emotions. You actually have to follow along with the story. And then you listen to the songs and you're like, they are 100% absolutely yes, singing their yeah. emotions. <laughs> but they're doing it in a way that doesn't feel like a musical where they just randomly break into song. And rather than just saying their emotions, it's things that are being alluded to. Yeah, which like, I like. Like Mine Hair, we'll talk about that because that was Sally's first yeah. big song. And it sets up her character mm -hmm. so much. And so many of the other songs also, if you listen to it, you're like, oh, that explains this. It's either foreshadowing or the character reflecting on something or kind of giving their backstory. Yeah. So rather than just saying like, I'm happy now, I'm going to sing the song about being happy and how happy I am at this moment. It's character development that you couldn't easily get in a non-musical setting because you couldn't have, well, I guess you could just have someone say like, this is the way I am, why I am. Yeah. And here is my character. And uh, bad movies often do that. And musicals have a nice little shortcut that they can get away with doing that. Yeah, you can and, sing. <laughs> And even in this movie where they're not quite doing that, it's a really interesting way to kind of get the same effect. And I think even in a better way, because it's usually a little more insightful than just singing about what's happening at the moment. Yeah. So let's get into Mine Hair. Perfect. First of all, fucking kills. Such a good song. So good. Such a good song. was a fine affair, but now it's over, and though I used to care, I need the open air, you're better off without me, mine hair, don't dab your eye, mine hair, I wonder why, mine hair, I've always said that I was a rover, you mustn't knit your brows, you should have known by now, you'd every cause to doubt me, mine hair. 
I love Liza Minnelli's voice. Oh, she's fantastic. What a treasure. <laughs> Listen, sorry, this thought might be a little all over the place, but we've listened to three or four different versions of Cabaret because there are quite a few cast recordings out there. Liza Minnelli does it in a way that really suits the character of Sally Bowles, this like kind of all over the place, disorganized, kind of frantic young girl and I think that she does a really good job of singing like that. And I think um, that's something that Natasha Richardson kind of lacks. And I've never seen her actually physically play the role. So I maybe it's a bad comparison. But I think Liza Minnelli does it in a way that really makes sense for who Sally is and what her character does throughout the movie. Of course, I had to come defend Natasha Richardson. Of course, I no, her no, no. So Nothing much. against but Natasha Richardson. No, absolutely. <laughs> I think the good thing about Natasha Richardson, I don't, she's clearly not as strong of a straight up singer. No, no. Like no one's going to really compete Very with Liza Very different on ranges, that. yeah. But that works. Yeah. For Sally. In this movie where people look like they would look, having someone who is at this like third rate cabaret yeah. not be a terrific singer is completely fine. And I'm not sure, but I had imagined some of the criticism at the time was like, she's too good. Why is she in this? Yeah. Category? But I think what she brings to it is a, 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 a naivete, a rawness, and a sense of desperation almost in her singing. Desperation is a good way to put it. And I think that could be said with the, the performances of most people in this movie. There is a certain manic energy behind this movie, even though it's not a... a not nearly as quick paced as I would say pretty much every other musical yeah. ever made. There is that kind of energy behind it, a nervous energy and a desperation for something to yeah. happen. This movie is crafted very patiently, but there is not a lot of patience by the characters. Yeah. And I think that Liza Minnelli does such a good job of portraying, um, Sally, who is someone who is literally singing for her supper. Yeah. Like she needs the money. And if she doesn't do well, she won't have food or she won't have gin or she won't have a roof over her head. And you can feel that in her performance, um, just how quickly her life could slide the other way and become destitute. And I think you, you really feel that. And on a larger scale, of course, that's reflecting the desperation in in Germany yes, of the time. Yeah. That's how that's how the Nazis came into power. That's how fascists always come into power. It's times of desperation where people are looking to cling on to something. Yeah. And we'll, we'll probably just keep getting into it. But <laughs> if you go further along that line, Liza, not Liza, Sally is someone who is desperate for attention for love mm -hmm. she wants someone to love her to care about her and at the time in germany if you are someone who is looking for any sort of human interaction you're looking for some sort of respite from your life and somebody comes along and gives you hope you're gonna go with it yeah. and maybe that someone is a nazi and that's how that's how this gets going right i think yeah that they prey on the desperate they prey on the desperate and the lonely and they make you feel like you're part of something yeah. and that's all that liza really wants in the world is to feel like somebody cares about her and that she has like a reason god damn this movie's it's great man <laughs> the, and we started talking but a little bit after we watched it first and we yeah. had to like stop yeah because we were, we were yeah we were so excited we were like save it save, save it, it save it podcast. save it <laughs> but okay back to mine hair okay i love how the pace of it builds yes there aren't many songs in musicals that you'll be like nodding your head along to and then yeah. by the end like stomping your foot yeah. along with and mine hair does that it's it's great it uh I'd kind of forgotten how good it was. <laughs> I, yeah, I like this one. And I do feel like the tempo kind of reflects Sally's whole story arc throughout the musical yeah. as well. I feel like towards the end with the baby and getting married and the 
and the threat of the Nazis and everything. I feel like it is that really fast, like loud spinning. It starts off and you think you're in control yeah. and then it just goes and goes and exactly. goes and suddenly. Yeah. And suddenly you're out of control and it's very loud and like crazy. And I, I feel like it's a really good representation of her whole thing in this movie. See, that's the other reason I named this as my favorite musical. The music itself is reflective of the story, mm-hmm. right? There are songs in this that are microcosms for entire themes that they're talking about. And not just in the lyrics, but how the pacing is. And that's just, it, it's brilliant. It works on so many levels. And maybe I just don't love musicals as much as you and I don't see it in other ones. But it just seems to someone who's more literate in the world of film than of music, a movie like this and a musical like this has so many things that I can be like, I can break it down and I can see the point of so much of it. And that's why it always stands out to me. Yeah. But Brian, Brian, right? I always want to say Cliff. He's Cliff usually. Uh, But Brian Brian should have listened. What a weird name to have in a 1930s musical. (laughs) There's so many Brians out there. Were there? Brian? I feel like that's a pretty common name. I feel like that's such a modern name. that. Well, I think it's kind of gone now. Oh. I work with a lot of babies. There's no baby Brian's anymore. Oh, really? Oh, everyone named Brian is over 30. True. Actually, no, there were there were three Brian's in my elementary school class. Oh, yeah. I had three as One well. One of mine. Yeah. I feel like it was very, very popular around our age. And then... Yeah. <laughs> baby Brian is weird. That's a weird baby name. <laughs> Even weirder than Baby Cliff. Yeah. Cliff was his name usually when he's British. Oh, okay. But he, he should have listened. Because yeah. she's telling him right there, like, I'm not going to change. No. People think they can change me, but you can't. I mean, you can't like, turn vinegar into jam, no, mine hair. I wasn't kidding. A lion is a lion, not a lamb, mine hair. Yeah. I wasn't kidding. She just tells I'm you. a rover. Yeah. It's not going to be. Of course, we don't know her at this point, And you just kind of think it's a song. And then you watch the movie and be like, oh, she just told you exactly, exactly what's going to happen. Is, yeah. If you try to fall in love with her, she's she, she's fickle. Yeah. She has whims. She's wild. <laughs> Man. Yeah. It's a, it's a really great way to tell the audience without them realizing and then having that like full circle moment towards the end when it's all like happening on screen. Yeah. A musical's so interesting in that way. And maybe I think this is a little separate because it is a song that is on stage Mm -hmm. that we don't take it to be completely literal while if in sound of music that started and it was a non-diegetic song just something that's in her own mind kind of presumably yeah you would be like oh she's just telling you who she is yeah it is here you kind of get a little cheat because it doesn't seem like that it's like sneaky yeah because you're like, is she just singing whatever cabaret song on stage that's popular? Or mm-hmm. is this her internal dialogue? Both. Both. And then I just love the energy that she brings to everything. Because we get the meeting, we get the meeting of her and Brian and how she calls the cigarettes wildly devastating. <laughs> yeah. All of that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. She reminds me a bit of like... Um, Holly go lightly. My next line right <laughs> underneath that said very breakfast at Tiffany. Yeah, she's like, they, they have a very similar type of speech as well as um, just like life arc. Well, and then the love stories. Yeah. Also very similar, very especially similar. if you go get the, the book of yes. um, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Uh, which is totally different from the movie. Everybody yeah. go read the book. <laughs> the book is quite similar to Cabaret in a lot of ways. It is actually, yeah. And you get that like darkness that they totally edited out in Breakfast at Tiffany's, the movie. Yeah. <laughs> Still a good movie, Still, but oh, a different Oh, it's a great movie. movie but I... Uh, Real racist, though. Yes. And then we have that wrestling scene, which is... I, I made too disgust. Yeah. I'd imagine. There were some interesting moments in this where I was like, that's not like that's uncomfortable. And I think that's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. I think it's and it's intercut with shots of the audience. So we get to kind of associate the two. We associate yeah. this disgusting thing we are seeing these little flashes of with these people laughing at it. And the subtext is kind of look at what people are laughing at when all of that's happening outside. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
there were a couple times in this movie where you get the cabaret being crazy and frantic and like all over the place and cut with what's actually happening in the real world like when that man's being beaten up by nazis Mm -hmm. and it's an interesting comparison i guess and i think in the stage play the character of the MC kind of morphs into different characters. Right. And is almost like a, an apparition. He can kind of walk through things mm-hmm. without being in that world. And he takes on different roles. Right. And you couldn't really do that, especially the way they went with this movie being very realist. So to get those points across of having the parallels of the music with what's going on in the outside world. I thought that intercutting was a very effective way to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I liked that. And um, I'm not a huge fan of Joel Gray's host. Sure. I think Alan Cumming, I have seen a few clips of him being the host and I think that he is, I don't know. I think I like him better. Well, Alan Cummings a fucking treasure and He's, I love him. So Yeah, I feel like I want I won't to see, argue with that. I want to see Liza Minnelli and Alan Cumming in this. Oh, wow. I want that cast. Maybe I could edit it together. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I feel like um, Joel Grave was just a little too creepy. But if that's what you're going for, yeah. I would agree that it is less enjoyable. But that's clearly, I just love Ellen coming. And like, I that's... felt like it took me out because he was so creepy or, like, weird. He was a little harder to figure out for me. Yeah. Because Alan Cumming plays it creepy as well and weird, but... I could understand what he is trying to do. And mm. with Joel Gray's, I had a little bit of a harder time with that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. The next bit that I really liked was that screaming under the train. Yes. Because that's kind of uh, outside of mine hair. That's her introduction. And just in case you thought that she was just another one of those characters, like kind of quirky and eccentric, but I'm yeah. a free spirit. Not unlike um, Maria. Yes. Right. For the, for that world. But then when you see her under the subway screaming, you realize that, no, there's something else going on here. There's something in her that needs to get out. There is that that desperation yeah. I was talking about. And it's mixed with when she does scream and gets a chance to let it out. There's this weird euphoria. There's an, an embarrassment and a almost a sexual euphoria that she kind of goes through right after as well. Yeah. Normally I would say maybe I'm seeing too much into things if you see anything sexual, but in this movie, everything's very sexual. So there's a very orgasmic quality. Yeah. And she's shy and kind of giggly after, and you can see that that kind of broke her facade for a minute. Yeah. And I think that's when Brian really like realizes that he likes her. He gets to see this like real part of her for a moment. For a moment. There's not many of those. No. She's a, she's a performer through and through. Yeah, absolutely. So then we get that scene you were talking about of that guy who throws a Nazi out of the club and then gets beaten up and it's intercut with uh, the performance on stage. Usually when we see Nazis portrayed in film, we mostly see American films. Yeah. And they always take out all of the anti-communist stuff, right? Because the Americans Mm -hmm. are so anti-communist, they can't be like, well, we agreed with them on this one. So that was (laughs) nice that all the propaganda posters are what they were, which was very anti-communist. And there's that line about letting the Nazis take care of the communists. Right. That's a big one. And it's really interesting. Because, yeah, you you don't hear as much. And I, I kind of had forgotten just how prominent the communists were at the time with the Nazis. And that it was these two kind of warring groups. And then the people who kind of considered themselves to be like the regular everyday Germans. Until they became Nazis. But um, it was really interesting to see that um, war between those two groups. And now if you call someone a communist in the Western world, it's like the worst thing. But if you do like a bunch of Nazi stuff, you're like, yeah, you could still be elected to office. You know what? History, another day. Let's go on. (laughs) And we get the introduction of uh, Fräulein Landauer. And is it Fritz? Fritz, yeah. So these characters, I 
don't think are in the play because we have a whole thing with uh, Fräulein Schneider, the uh, hostess, or what would you call her, landlord uh, person? Landlady. There's a word for what she is. Innkeeper? Innkeeper? I don't, I, I don't think Anyways, it's like an inn, her though. and uh, Herr Schultz are the equivalent in the, in the play, and they sing to each other. Oh, okay. And it's a shame we don't get a bunch of those, but that story to summarize is that she is in love with him, and uh, he's in love with her, but he she discovers he's Jewish, and then she's debating, like, well, could I go through with this? My life would be very much different. And a lot of it is the financial part. She's like, I would probably lose my business and all of that kind of stuff. Right. So it's a really similar thing we see with Landauer and Fritz. Yeah. And I love the meeting first when Sally meets her and the juxtaposition of their kind of uh, different classes in yeah. life. And I love how Sally, though, doesn't like take any shit or anything. And she gives her hand to yeah. the rich heiress and says, how do you do? <laughs> um, yeah, I liked this scene. I liked Natalia Landau's, like the way that she, her whole character, I enjoyed her whole character because it was She's very... She's a fancy rich one. And yeah. Those are your, that's your jam. <laughs> yes. Um, but also like it just, it was a good juxtaposition of her being like proper fancy and um then you get maximilian who is like wild and like fancy rich and so you get a really good juxtaposition of people in this and you have kind of an opposite to everybody then the next plot point is that sally is going to go meet her dad but her dad doesn't show And this scene was very effective for me because she, within one minute, goes from like, oh, it's fine, no big deal, to hating him, Mm -hmm. to then making excuses for him, and then just internalizing this worthlessness and saying, like, maybe he's right and I'm not worth caring about. You could say that it's very uh, telegraphed and very Mm -hmm. typical because it is a movie, but... Man, I've seen that in people, and I've seen that cycle, and it it seemed very, very true to life to me. And we call that daddy issues. <laughs> yeah, or like abusive relations. Yeah. There's so many things yeah, where absolutely. it goes from like, yeah, no big deal, and then pretty soon you're making excuses for them and saying it's your fault. Yeah. Because it's, sometimes it's a lot easier to blame yourself than to blame others, and or just not have a reason for something. Yeah, true. And that tells you so much about her character and how she continues to seek this attention and love in wherever. Yeah. On stage. And then we get the song Maybe This Time, which is the song that I knew best and have done at like uh, show tune karaoke um, without even seeing Cabaret. I just I just know it. <laughs> so then this is something I want to ask you. So we get the beginnings of the romance with Brian right before maybe this time. Uh So there was, of course, him saying that he doesn't go with girls or whatever the line was. And then, well, maybe you were the right one. Those other three weren't the weren't the right ones. Yeah. And we'll get into that a lot more. What's going on with Brian? Because he might have a character that seems like he's yeah, he's the straight man. Yeah. But he's not in a few different ways. (laughs) But for something like maybe this time, or for the title for Cabaret, Mm -hmm. for someone who hadn't seen all of it, but knew the songs, did all of these songs seem very optimistic before? No. Oh, no. No. Because when I hear Life is a Cabaret, people think of like, yeah, fun times, right? I'm like, no, that's not what that song's about. Yeah, that one seems a little more optimistic upon like first introduction to it. But you do kind of like I already kind of knew some of the like things that happen in or like the darkness of this musical. Sure. Um, because Cabaret like in the musical theater community is known as a very dark musical and it's not one that you're going to do in school. (laughs) It's not one that any children are going to be able to perform. So you, you know that like cabaret is almost like forbidden fruit. It's, it's not one that is done very often. Um, And I think I knew that just from like 
knowing musicals. So I knew that it wasn't a super optimistic song, but I can see where people are coming from saying life is a cabaret, like it's a carefree, easy, fun song. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe this time I definitely knew the kind of like the subtext that goes within, like the feeling. Um, And I just think it's like such a great song. But I think it is maybe the most hopeful song. Yeah. But even then, that hopefulness is still restrained because it's not, this is going to happen for me. It's maybe this time. And I think watching this changed my 20-year-long opinion of Natasha Richardson being the Sally Bowles. Uh When I saw this, I was like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to her. Because like we were saying earlier, um, Richardson's not as strong of a singer, but it works because she embodied what I thought Sally is, who's yeah. also like Natasha Richardson's a great singer. Like that's of yeah. Course. Oh no, no, we're not we're not bashing her, <laughs> but she doesn't have the range of a of Eliza Minnelli. No. Not many do. <laughs> so I thought, like, yes, Sally shouldn't be amazing. She's unsuccessful, but here we have Liza who can sing. Like yes, absolutely. But she brought this rawness and desperation and uh, youth. Mm -hmm. Not innocence, but um, like a wonder about certain things. Yeah, like a youngness. Yeah, definitely. That energy. And that's what made this great. Because she couldn't do the same thing Natasha Richardson's doing or any of the other ones. You have to bring your own thing to do it to what suits your voice as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And Liza can overpower anyone with with her voice. So she had to find a different way into it. And she kind of goes too far. Yeah. She gets unhinged at points. Yeah. And that's why it's beautiful. That's where she's tapping into what Sally is. It's not just like, hey, look how good of a singer I am. Because she could do that all she wants. And so many of these other people could could too to just show off how good of a singer they are. But this is why I think Liza's so great. Because if you're singing in a musical, I feel like the quality of your singing is about 50% of what makes it good. And the other 50% is the, uh, I don't know how to say performance, like the acting performance yeah. of it. Because you are acting this song you are not just singing no. this song this song has to give insight into your character or move the plot along or whatever it is so just like if someone memorizes all of their lines you know what that's not enough you have to do something more and i think in a musical you have to be able to act that song and she she does everything every time she's on stage the emotions of that character are just flying at you yeah She's bare on stage. She shows you everything when she's on stage. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think she's the best Sally now. <laughs> I loved it. Yeah, this song, like Mine Hair, gets very raw and emotional towards the end or like midway through where you feel this desperate, like little girl almost in it's like it. She's begging. This yeah. is a song of her begging for this to finally work out for her. Yeah. And she just wants like, maybe this time I'll win. And it's it's so raw in that moment a few times that she sings that. And you can feel her heart breaking because her dad didn't show up. And this guy wants something different from her or they didn't pick her to be in this movie or like whatever heartbreak she's having at the moment. You can feel it come up out of this song. And I feel like this song embodies so many problems in her life, but also the, it like fits perfectly in this moment of the movie. Everybody loves a winner. So nobody loved me Lady peaceful Lady happy That's what I long to be Well, all the odds are They're in my favor Something's bound to be Oh, they love a 
lyrics in so many of these are so heartbreaking. Yes. Everybody loves a winner, so nobody loved me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, there's some, there's some like really heartbreaking things. It just says, Lady Peaceful, Lady Happy, that's, that's who, who I, I long, long to be. be. Because she knows she's not that person. Mm-hmm. And I think, what's her name, the fancy lady? I think she's that lady peaceful lady happy to Liza or to Sally yeah. and she sees this beautiful perfect poised woman and um doesn't realize that she also has problems she just sees someone fancy with all this money maybe this is the best song I'd i don't know say so, it's but... there's those three and we'll probably talk about which three are all just so good but She's giving everything. She's begging the universe for some sort of support. She's bearing her soul. And then we go to the audience and there's like three people clapping. Yeah. See, that's why this is a great movie. Mm -hmm. Not just a great musical because it's not everyone jumps up and applauds like they do in every other movie. They're reacting in a way that emphasizes what she was talking about. Like, no, you're not getting any breaks. Yeah. It's not maybe this time and then it all happens and everything works out for her. It's maybe this time. Nope. Turns out no. Nope. Not this time. Yeah. You get this. Not every house is a packed house. And I feel like a lot of musicals make it look like, oh, I work at this super successful club and I just need my big break, even though it's busy every night. Burlesque. Yeah. How the fuck is that place packed every night? I don't know. And where's the budget for all that? Like, the club in burlesque had a bigger budget than the movie of Cabaret. Yeah. <laughs> also, this was a very low budget movie. Was it was it? Uh, $3 million. Oh, wow. Which huh. was quite low for that time. Um, That's surprising. But yeah, I... But also not. But also not. It's surprising in that a movie of this stature was made for that little, but not surprising. And when you look at what the stage and the mm-hmm. costuming is, you're like, oh, yeah, they went... It's actual cheap stuff. Not, yes. Not yeah. Expensive stuff made to look cheap. All the tech end of stuff. I think they would have loved to have had some more money. Oh, I bet. So then we get the meeting with Max, who is a rich playboy type. And I liked how when she meets him, she said a lot of the same things she said when she first met Brian. So yeah. we kind of see that it's just a little bit of a routine. I felt a little sad for Brian when Max came into the picture. Oh, of course. Because, yeah, you can see that he's he's like a more normal human that would exist in the world. And I think he's looking at Sally like someone that he could settle down with and like be with. And she's very clearly just living that glamorous like showbiz life where she just flits from one thing to the next thing. And like she says in her first song, Mine Hair, she's like, I'm I'm a rover. (laughs) I actually disagree. Oh, I don't think Brian was looking to settle down with Sally. No, I think he was trying to delude himself into thinking he could. Hmm. But we'll we'll get into that stuff as it comes up. Sounds good. Then we have the song Money. Yeah, which is funny. I liked it. This is quite different in different versions, how the song goes. But it's one where, yeah, I didn't love the song, but it is another driving force of the characters, right? Especially right after Max gets there, it makes sense to cut to the song. Yeah. And then we go back to Max and he's waking them up in... He rubs like a champagne bottle on her as she's sleeping. Yeah, that's and weird. And it's like bringing food to a cat and they just kind of sniff it and start waking up. She's the same way. Like, wait, money? Rich stuff? Fancy things? Champagne. And she wakes up and then they go and, um, you know, order caviar. I think it's very funny that it's a bottle of Henkel Trocken, which is like a wine you can get now. And then when she orders the caviar, of course, our cut then is right to a dead body. Yeah. Just to show again, like, yeah, you're all caught up in these things, but this is still going on and your money can only protect you for so long. Very true. And then there's that line. I think it's it is Max who says it, that the Nazis are just here to take care of the communists. And after that, we'll be able to control them. Yeah. Little did they know. Nobody could control them. Then we get two ladies. Yes. Yeah. I like this song in the 98 version 
This one was a little, it's a little grating because... Uh, it's very high-pitched. Yeah, Gray is doing, he's doing a voice, of course, yeah. in this to play the character. And it's a, the longer he sings, it can be a little, yeah. it can be a little grating on you sometimes. Yeah, um, it felt very fantastic because it is supposed to like suspend reality, but it also seems very um, like out there and wild. This whole, with all the lifts and the skirts and the big sheet and everything. Like, it's just very wild, I think. It seems like exactly what you'd expect a kind of shitty body cabaret to, yeah. to be doing. Yeah, absolutely. And then that, of course, is alluding to what's going to be happening when they go to Max's place. Yeah. We can talk about it a bit, a bit here. So when you see Brian kind of getting grumpy during this, you assume it's a, a jealousy. Yes. A like, that's my woman kind of moment. Oh, well, I was going to ask a jealousy of whom? So when you're first watching it, you don't actually know the second piece of. But we did, upon our introduction to him, he says that he doesn't sleep with women. Yes. So we do have that. Yeah. But he also double backs on that and says, like, I don't sleep with the women anymore because. Right. Like, and you get the explanation. So it's, like, pretty easy to be like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. He just, like, misspoke and it sounded like a double meaning, but it, it wasn't. Oh, see, that part to me did not. that Because even when he's explaining, he just said, oh, I've done it three times and I never enjoyed it. That kind of is not doubling back to me. That's doubling down on like, yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, I don't know. It was, that wasn't how I read it the first time we watched it, not knowing kind of what develops later on in the in the movie. I think we'll talk about it again later on when we get some of those revelations. But to me, I read Brian's character as being gay, not even being bisexual, right. but that he was gay and he's trying his best to not be to fit in because it's not of course it's not going to be an easy life and even if you're in a place right now for the moment where maybe it's a little bit easier it's only going to get worse yeah well of course you got the nazis we know and he's going to have to eventually go back to like england and not be living in cabarets in, right eventually yes and knowing having the historical context of the time you know that things do not go well for anybody who isn't a like straight german aryan aryan person and um you kind of feel that danger um once i'd kind of figured it out especially in this scene um i think you see yeah i agree with you i think he's trying to fit this mold that is so very safe at the moment so when you were saying that he was disappointed because he was looking forward to that life, I think those moments later when we see him like in the forest and he's just not quite there. Yeah. It's his true self coming through, knowing that he can't live this lie. Yeah. That's what I, that's a, a take. I'm not saying that is definitive by any stretch. You could read him as bisexual. You could read him as fully in love with Sally. I think that's legitimate as well. But mm -hmm. I kind of thought he was convincing himself he was that he found a relationship that could work for him. Mm -hmm. And the way she is um, like free and uh, liberated in so many ways, he's kind of feeling like this is probably the safest space for me. Yeah. And he's trying to wedge himself in there. Yeah. And he's like, and then maybe every now and then I can mess around with a dude too. And that would be nice. But yeah, who knows? It's a hard role, I would say, because you're getting the job. You look at this character and you get Michael York playing and we never mentioned him yet, but I think he's fantastic and underappreciated because he doesn't get to do the big things that Liza gets to do, right? Everything that Michael York is doing in this is, is so small and subtle, and a lot of it does not get explained, while Liza gets to have entire songs telling you what she really means. Yeah. He doesn't, so everything is so dependent on his 
delivery of not a whole lot of lines and then his reactions to things. And I love just watching him while other stuff is happening. You see him react, you see how upset he's getting, and then you have to question which part of those things made him upset. But I think Michael York gave a underappreciated, fantastic performance in this. Yeah, I agree. And he's someone who... Do you know Michael York? Not really, no. I bet... He's in so many things, and rather than list them, I bet you will look this up while I'm talking and then be like, oh, I've seen like 20 movies he's in. Probably the stuff he did later in life that got popular, uh, you know, in your lifetime, yeah. in our lifetime. In our, in my lifetime. <laughs> I watch movies from before my lifetime a lot. Yes, so. true. Um, but yes, I have definitely seen him in things, and um, he's been in... A lot of big movies mm -hmm. that maybe I haven't seen, but I do know who he is then. Yeah. Interesting. So then they go out there in the German countryside and we get the only song not at the Kit Kat Club with Tomorrow Belongs to Me. And this is uh, just an amazing piece of uh, filmmaking and musical cinema, I'd say. I just can talk about this a lot. So let's. Okay. What do you think about it? Um... I can see, like, I know this isn't, like, a real song um, in the world other than in Cabaret. Can I interrupt for a brief moment? Yeah. Uh, they were accused of being Nazi sympathizers because they're saying, like, you're using these real Nazi songs and how dare you? This is a Nazi movie. Meanwhile, Kendra and Hebb, both Jewish, wrote the song, which is distinctly anti-Nazi, but... Just like with so many things, if you just involve something, people don't take the time into look yeah. into the nuance. But yes, this was written for, for this. Um, yeah, I just feel like it felt very nationalist and like it, it had that feeling. So I think they did a really good job of writing a song like this. I know it's it's um, meant to be anti fascist and that kind of thing but um i can see why people would think that it was like pro-nazi because it totally sounds like a an anthem that they would have had i think first of all the song i think is fantastic oh it's a great song yeah. but how this scene is directed is some of the more subtle work because there's some real jarring stuff going on yes. but i think the most well-crafted direction maybe of the entire movie if you're watching a movie that deals with uh, slavery, we're always going to be following the one white family who's smuggling people out, right. right? If it deals with Nazis, we're always with the freedom fighters. Yes. We just kind of ignore that the vast majority of people just go along with yeah. things. They're not necessarily the ones out there putting people in gas chambers, but they're not the ones fighting against it either. Yeah. They're the path of least resistance. This is what's happening. So I just go with it because the vast majority of people of Germany weren't evil human beings. No. They were weak willed and went along with things, yeah. which the vast majority of humans will do. Mm -hmm. And we see that all the time. And, but it's, it's so much easier for us not to come confront that. In our movies, we want to be along on the ride with the good guys who are fighting the good fight that we have generations of uh, hindsight to see like, yep, this is the good side. That's the bad side. Yeah. Or we want the bad people to be like, yes, I'm uh, twirling my mustache. I'm a big evil guy. I'm going to kill all these people because that's who I am. And I'm evil. I'm an unfathomable evil. Yeah. What we don't like to see is just some guy who could be anyone being like, you know what? They got some good points. I'm, yeah. I'm going along with it. Yeah, that like every day who could be anybody in your life. And that's yeah. what this movie does a great job of highlighting. It shows how easily hatred can be spread when not confronted. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I was talking about when I was saying that this movie is about political, the dangers of political apathy. Mm -hmm. And I hope everyone listening to us now or watch this movie will take those ideals to heart because yes. of course i'm sure people think this of every time they have lived in but i feel like there's a lot of things that are happening in our time which is very easy to just be like you know what it's so much easier to not say mm -hmm. anything right now and in just kind of like our province in in the world our in our country in north america and <laughs> yeah. other parts there's there's just a lot and there probably kind of always is but it's just kind of underscoring the idea of 
say something. Yes. But uh, as it relates to this scene, how it starts with this one boy singing. And you're like, oh, this is a nice song. This is an idyllic little German village song. Yeah. And the song starts beautifully, just like these movements do. These movements start with the idea of hope, of yes. something new. And then a couple more people joined in. And you're like, okay, there's a couple people singing it. But then when it pans down to that armband, yeah. then we know. And it instantly, for us, with those generations of hindsight, yes. goes from this inspirational or idyllic country song to to terror. Yes. It goes to something truly frightening. And how the song spreads through the group of people, I feel is a very intentional uh, metaphor for the spread of Nazism throughout Germany. Mm -hmm. It starts with one inspirational figure. It goes to a couple people who are joining it. And then once there's a few people doing it and nobody is saying anything to them, the other people are thinking of one of two things like, oh, I can say this now too. And no one's going to stop me yeah. because I believe those things. Yeah. So then the next group of people gets on. And then the other people are the ones who are like, oh, everyone's doing this. I better get up and say. I better get on board yeah. too. Because you do see at the beginning of this song going as people are starting to stand up and sing and like sing really forcefully, I guess. Like passionately. Passionately. Um, you can see a couple people in the crowd looking as their neighbors stand up right and yeah. they're like oh okay like and the one old man who's just doesn't know what to do yeah and then you see these people other than the one old man that you mentioned you see these people get up towards the end or like the middle of the song because everybody else is standing and it was also kind of known that like if you didn't go along with it, you probably weren't going to be okay after. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there was that like fear as well. And so you can see everybody jump up and you can feel kind of, again, that frantic energy of like, I need to be seen supporting this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was such a great example of how hatred can spread through a culture yeah. done in this one scene of just people singing a song. Yeah. That's why I think it's this might be the height of the the direction of this movie. Yeah, and some of the imagery in this movie having that historical context and like knowing what happens in a year or two, um, it makes me very uncomfortable to see. When you were saying that you cried multiple times in Sound of Music, this got me closer than anything oh. because out of like I felt actually. I watch a lot of horror movies. Yeah. They don't scare me. No. This gave me a very visceral reaction. Yeah. I found it truly frightening. And I know we can say like, yeah, the Nazis are scary and we, we are detached from it and we don't have that same fear. Something in this, seeing how it's spread yeah. and seeing what you first think is joy on people's faces yeah. turn to hatred was truly frightening in in a way that i haven't seen something in another movie scare me that much in a while yeah and it i, was I very agree well done. the visualization of the swastika and those uniforms and the salute and everything that i, I definitely had like a little jolt in my stomach when you see those things because they are in our time like known as not good and you don't display those things and you don't see those things very often i mean you do but you do you do but it's never in a good context and so it is it was like a little jarring to me to see those things and in the sound of music as well just like on display like that and just feeling like oh like the chill of like knowing what's what's happening and what's gonna happen but the thing that was different, because I watch, you know, straight up war movies where there's yes. Nazis. That doesn't like have that same effect to me. Nothing in Sound of Music had that kind of effect on me. But here it's just people. Yeah. It's not the the soldiers of uh, of Sound of Music right. or, or any of the war yeah, movies. Yeah, in the like big city, in the town square, that kind of thing. It These was... are just like a bunch of village girls who I know would 
want me dead given the opportunity. Yeah. And that's that's scary. That's scary. That is scary. Yeah. I need to like move on. Okay. <laughs> but it's so good. Things progress a little bit more with uh, Landauer and Fritz. There's the scene about him jumping on the running board. And for some reason, that always stuck with me when she's like, what are you doing? He's like, I don't know. I've never done something like that before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we get the reveal of, um, like, oh, screw Max. And she says, I am. Yeah, and how this the performance of both of them in this because she's saying it to hurt him. Yes, and then he says, "Me too." Like and fact. you see her <laughs> reaction. Yeah, because in her life in these type of situations, I would assume she's been the one who's kind of like giving this kind of news. Yeah, and she did not see that coming, and you get to see her be like shocked and then truly hurt again yes. that we haven't really seen that come through since the the time with her father or when she's on stage yeah you get the real emotion and of course she then quickly uh covers it up with um i can't remember what she says oh like oh you two bastards or yeah. whatever it is but when she doesn't know what to say at first liza's like a good actress as well i yeah. feel like in my lifetime she's only been a joke yeah, or like a caricature. Yeah. Like, it's very... We're of an age where we know her as Lucille Ostero more than yes. someone who yeah. won... I think she won a Tony and an Oscar by the time she was like 24. That's crazy. She was... Yeah, she was something. Yeah, because she has an EGOT. <laughs> and you, you see it here. Yeah, and she's just... Yeah, in a way that lots of performers only like dream of being talented and now uh since we watched this i watched some interviews of her much later in life talking about the movie mm -hmm. what i used to see in her as a um eccentrism of um like celebrity kind of thing yeah i now see as complete earnestness in everything and i kind of love it i might go watch a bunch of her <laughs> stuff now i i yeah, I, you're right. I do think of her as her character in like Arrested Development, and she plays these cameo roles and things. Well, she's usually playing herself. Yeah, and, or a heightened version or of herself a, like to make fun of it. Kind extra, of. extra far version of herself, and so it's really interesting to kind of see her just be her. Because I did go into this thinking about the Liza Minnelli of later years and um it's just really interesting to see how good of a performer she actually is yeah <laughs> i guess that's that's what i that's what i'm leading to because she's incredible in this and she totally deserves that egot and i think it's just really impressive um the talent that she has and just like how amazing she is in this movie it's my love letter to Liza Minnelli. <laughs> Wholeheartedly agree. I, uh, yeah, I, I didn't know. And shame on me for not knowing. Because there's a, a world of people out there who are like, yeah, of course, she's fucking Liza. There's a reason <laughs> she's like so iconic. And Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like I've done her wrong because I didn't know how great she was. <laughs> So then after this argument between Sally and Brian, he goes out and he, he can't take the Nazis anymore. So he gets into that fight, gets beat up real bad, goes to the hospital. Oh, Landauer's dog is killed. Oh, that was real that sad. Was, that was another like really hard scene to see. And the fear that she had. Mm -hmm. It was, yeah, that was sad. Uh, there were some scenes in this movie that were... Like, you knew this stuff happened, but it's really hard to kind of watch it unfold on the screen. And then we hear, God damn it, I'm going to have a baby. That <laughs> yeah. scene, that was kind of fun. And then they just, like, get hammered and decide to get married. Yeah, it was a different time. <laughs> well, yeah, that's... <laughs> First off, there's all those prairie oysters she was Ugh. eating. That just sounds terrible. But she says this thing when they're drunk celebrating... That is like the saddest thing. And she says, I guess babies have to love you no matter what. Yeah. And that's when you get to see 
a really like uncensored version of just how badly she wants to be loved. Yeah. Is that like, well, maybe I'll have this baby because babies have to love you. And that's that's a very real thing that people do as well. Yes, absolutely. People have children so that they have someone who needs them. And it's, yeah, it's really interesting to see her go through that thought process of like, yeah, I'll have the baby and we'll live happily ever after Mm -hmm. like a fairy tale because that is how she kind of sees her life. Yeah. (sighs) It's it's a, an amazingly well-written tragic character. It is. I, I hate when people kind of relegate this to a 70s manic pixie dream girl because there, there's so much more going oh, on Oh, totally, here. yeah. Then back at the house, we have uh, Fritz and Brian coming in and there's the bit about like, oh yeah, they're bankers, the Jews are bankers and communists. And so I'm going, well, how could they be bankers and communists? The guy's like, oh, they'll get you one way or they'll get you the other. (sighs) And the fact that all this like conspiracy theory stuff comes from just some regular guy who we've heard from before shows how insidious that kind of thinking is and that's what this movie does a great job of doing as well like the nazis yeah. aren't some evil force over there they are right here they are your neighbors yeah and the idea of this propaganda of how easily yeah. it spreads well we we see it all the time we do and now that's such a, a hard thing in in my day-to-day life when i meet someone and I'm like, oh, this person's great. And like, oh, are they a Nazi? They might be a kind yeah. of, might be yeah. a bit of a Nazi. That is something that is like still prevalent and that I worry about. There was a dude on my hockey team not two years ago who had a big SS tattoo. On really? Him. Yeah. And I would just see that. And then he would talk to me. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am not a white man. And uh, he <laughs> yeah. would talk to me and like be very nice to me. And I'm like, but like I know what that is. That's not a... It's not something that kind of looks like something. He had he had uh, iron crosses and SS stuff. He had Straight Nazi up. tattoos all over him. And he, that's like, yeah, I don't understand how you can live in the world <laughs> if you feel like that. Well, you could run for office and you'd yeah. probably do pretty well. Oh. True. There's a lot of them out there. I know. I know every time I say stuff like this, like hot takes of, hey, Nazis are bad, we get bad reviews. That's why our Spotify is down so much, because on the RRR episode, I was against Indian nationalism. And I said, Muslims are people too, and people didn't like that. Interesting. So go uh, rate us on Spotify. Bring our rating back up. Yes, please. We got crushed. (laughs) But yeah, uh, how insidious it is of just being, the calls are coming from inside the house. It's not just some... A noble evil out there. It is right here. Yeah, it's your neighbors. And Fritz reveals that he is Jewish as well, but this fear of being ostracized is and and hurt is greater than his love. Or is it? That's what he's going to try to figure out. Yeah. Yeah, and I liked their their wedding scene, but you do with the like hindsight of what actually happened there. Uh, after you also feel this fear for them yeah, because you know that like they're happy right now because they've accepted like who they are and what they like, what their religion is and everything in there. They're having a happy moment, but you know, it's not going to be good for them in the future. And that's just another way that this movie challenges you in ways. Another musical for sure. Definitely wouldn't, but we have these two people Falling in love and this man revealing his true self and mm-hmm. being his true self. And in any other movie, that is a point of celebration. And here we have, yeah, of course, we have the wedding scene. But then we know that they, they probably die because of that. Yeah. Or because she's rich, they may have made it out. But maybe it, it's not going to be good for them. Yeah. <laughs> Their life as they know it is definitely over. Yes, in one way absolutely. And you know that it's it's only downhill from here. And before we have the wedding, we get, if they could see her, the song, which, again, plays with things where you think, oh, this is some silly song about being in love with a monkey. Yeah. And no, it is a metaphor for uh, what they're going through of being in love with someone who somebody else deems unworthy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was a was a a, a weird song. (laughs) How does it feel? Because I've, uh, of course, I know the ending of that song. I know what it's about. 
but watching it, because I assume that song you probably didn't. No, know. I've never heard that song. Um, so take me through it when you're watching it going from singing to a monkey to the switch at the end. Yeah, I saw it coming, but also didn't see it coming because I also didn't really want to believe that that's where this was going. Um, I I went from like, oh, this is funny. He's singing about like, maybe how ugly his girlfriend is or like like if you could just see her the way I see her you'd like her um and then as it gets more specific what he's singing about you start to realize that it's not just about being a monkey or like having an unattractive girlfriend or like whatever um that he seems to be singing about and then it's like oh no this is going where I think it's going and uh, it's very disappointing and I don't like it, but um, it is a good way to show just what Germany was like in 1931, I think, when this is set and just how awful it was getting even before everything got real awful. And by doing switches like that, it kind of makes you think about things and take new points of view very mm -hmm. quickly because you start forming your opinion on one thing and then you learn you're talking about something else and you kind yeah. of had that in your mind already and it it's it's a good uh, little tool for getting people to switch their point of view to take themselves out of any preconceptions by doing little tricks like yeah that. absolutely absolutely because there's there's other musicals and off the top of my head right now i cannot name another one where they do jokey things like this and it is just about the surface level yeah about the looks or like oh she's a monkey or like you know it's just not quite as deep as this movie or this show is and um i think that they do a really good job of it but yeah it really it really makes you think at the end if you're if you're mindlessly enjoying the song and then you realize that it's actually anti-jewish like ending and then you kind of lose the fact that there's some just great lyrics in this one too yeah when we're walking together they sneer if i'm holding her hand but if they could see her through my eyes maybe they'd all understand yeah that's really good yeah and then the whole like just why can't everyone leave us alone why can't you just live and let live yeah it's very simple but yeah very poignant still yeah absolutely just let us live our life and then we get the wedding and there's that scene where they are kind of just laying out in the woods having like a picnic or something. Yeah. And Cliff is just, or Brian is just off. Yeah. Right? There's no real reason given. And like a lot of Brian's motivation, we don't always see it. Yeah. Yeah. There's just something that happens with him off screen a lot of the time. And at times it's frustrating, but then it's also kind of fun that we can try to piece it together. Of mm -hmm. course, I've already been saying what I think was going on. But what did you feel at the time there? He was just having a bad day. Yeah. And I feel like there's a lot of turmoil in his life, obviously, because he is like pretty much fighting who he is as a person um, throughout the entire movie. And I think he and Max probably had a bad moment and that messed him up or something. I just kind of assumed that that's what it was. Um, and then also people just have emotions. Yeah. <laughs> people are in moods sometimes. But um, it was really interesting to see him down like that and how it affects Sally too because all of a sudden she's like well we can't be together because you're like this <laughs> and it's 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 a switch that flips and it's very abrupt so there's no lead up to it and maybe in the show there is lead up to Sally coming back without her fur coat and with no baby yeah so she goes and has an abortion and he takes it hard and he's kind of saying like that you had no right and all yeah. of that kind of stuff and his emotions at that point are are understandable and when she's telling him she's still kind of uh giving a performance yeah right she's she's always giving a performance and then even at a time like this she's like doing bits yeah almost i think I, that comes from she can never she feels like she can never be herself. She mm -hmm. feels and she believes that she is truly unlovable. And 
this is either a distancing mechanism yeah. or perhaps a performance because she feels like this performance person is uh, is more likable and lovable than than she is herself. Because life life is a cabaret after all. Yeah, she's always on. Yeah, and she needs those applause. So here is another time where we can kind of go back on what we think's going on with Cliff because she starts talking about being afraid of what their life would be. That she eventually would want to go back to the clubs. And then she says, and you would... And she kind of trails off. And he says, like, say it. And she doesn't say it. So that's why I thought he's gay. Of course, not 100%, because no one's really 100% anything. Yeah. But... He has some wiggle room, clearly, because they've been sleeping together. Mm -hmm. But she knows who he really is. Yeah, yeah. I don't think he knows who she really is because she doesn't let anyone. He knows more than anybody does, probably, in the world. Yeah. But when she trails off like that, at first I thought it was, and you'll resent me for it. Right. But the way he goes say it and she won't say it that makes me think that uh, that there was something else yeah. that she knows that their life together wouldn't be real no it would be a performance on yeah. on his part now yeah and i think that's a, a, an interesting thing too because we have cliff being sorry brian yeah. we have brian being this character who is supposed to be I know like the term is the straight man, but yeah. being someone who is is free from all of the kind of like Sally's a pretty crazy character. From She's all a the lot drama. Yeah. He's someone who is supposed to be kind of the audience's way in a lot of the time. Yeah. He's being a quote unquote normal person. And then we start learning that he's living a, a sort of double life. Yeah. At least that's that's what I think. This is no means of like definitive or anything. This is just because so much of what goes on with his character we don't get to see and this is what i took away from it. right but i think he prefers men and it's also kind of sad because being someone who prefers men but then is willing to marry liza minnelli kind of happens to her a couple times yeah and then also back when she revealed that she had been sleeping with max she said something about like he's suave and he knows how to treat a woman I don't know that she meant like spending money and stuff. Yeah. I don't think it's that. And I don't think it's uh, about being romantic or kind because he's clearly like a he's a good guy and he treats her well from everything we could see. Mm-hmm. So I think that means um, like on the sexual side of things. That's what I took that line to mean. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This show is so deep. <laughs> I just love that every character could be talked about for a long time. There's not a lot of... There's no simple answers in this movie. Like I said, this movie lives in the gray areas. There's not a lot of black and white here. Yeah, absolutely. And then with that, Brian goes home. Yeah. And they shake hands. Yeah. And that's just it. It, It's kind of an unsatisfying ending because I expected there to be some big passionate goodbye and really all she's doing is just like waving as she's walking away. Yeah. I thought there would be like a little bit more, but like, I get it. I feel like every movie that we've done so far that I say like, oh, this is like a fundamental piece of 70s cinema. You're like, yeah, it's good, but it felt kind of unsatisfying in the end. That's yeah. That's 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 part of it. Uh, That's the world, man. Yeah. Endings are unsatisfactory. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I, uh, it was an interesting way to end it. But you know what is pretty satisfactory is Liza Minnelli's next and last song, her performance of the titular Cabaret. Cabaret. This is the one you look at the lyrics and it's like, what good is sitting alone in your room? Come hear the music play. Yeah. Life is a cabaret, old chum. Come to the cabaret. So you're like, yeah, this is a song about not sitting and being sad. Yeah. It's about going out and having a good time. And I think it it intentionally tries to make you think that like yeah. she's getting over it yes. and she's going on. And then you start listening to it. And my favorite bit is her story about Elsie, you know, with whom she uh, shared four sorted rooms in Chelsea. Yes. 
who was a sex worker and dies. And when she died, everyone was just like, well, yeah, she drank all the time. She did a lot of drugs and now she's dead. That's what happens. But her takeaway from that is, yes, that's how I'm going out. Her takeaway from her friend overdosing or committing suicide, one of those two, was that that's that's the best case scenario. That's all she can hope for. And it's crushing. Yeah, wow. Come to the cabaret. And as for me, and as for me, I made my mind up back in Chelsea. When I go, I'm going like Elsie. Start by admitting from cradle to tomb. It isn't that long a stay. Life is a cabaret, old chum. It's only a You know me, I have I have a inner nihilist in me. But I love the line of start by admitting from cradle to tomb isn't that long a stay. I love that, but I take <laughs> it in a in a in a better way, I think, than she does. Yeah. I think um being okay with your mortality and confronting it is is good to put you at peace. Yeah. I don't know if that's where she's going with it. I think people look at this song as a a celebratory, inspirational song, but I feel like this song is either a song of denial Mm -hmm. or at least that it's an admission that she cannot exist in the outside world so that all of her life is a stage because that's where she has control and that's where she feels she can be loved. Yeah, and where she can be... The, like, sparkly, happy version of herself. Yeah. There's no worries on the stage. Yes, yeah. So when she's saying life is a cabaret, she's saying pretend to get through things. Yeah. And she's also the most, not relaxed, relaxed is probably the wrong word, but, like, the least frantic in this song. I don't know. I think when she's saying, uh, I think it's the line is Chelsea, when she, like, is, like, breaking. True. I think she's near tears. Mm -hmm. I think at the end of it, her eyes to me look like she has very wet eyes. And I probably was right there with her. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, she's got a she's got a hard road in this movie. And you she's not doing herself any favors and no no one else is doing her any favors either. No. And, you know, what what? Good is sitting and wallowing in it. Well, good is sitting well alone in your room. Go Might as well come hear the music play. Be on stage. Yeah. Huh. But her her life's a stage. And it also doubles up, of course, uh, from what we were talking about at the very beginning, the political apathy that she is just going to insulate herself in this literal cabaret. Yes. To protect her from anything outside, from from relationships that have gone wrong, from her father, from from the Nazi rise, right? Mm-hmm. She's unwilling to deal with any of it. And her apathy, or maybe not even apathy, her distinct decision to not engage with anything that she doesn't find uh, pleasurable. Mm-hmm. Is of course like a, a great metaphor for for people and how something like like Nazism can take control of a country, right? Yeah. We just don't want to deal with that. Yeah. And why would you? It's terrible. Mm-hmm. But you have to. Yeah. Life is not a cabaret. It's not. You have to wake up and actually deal with the world. Huh. Well. At least that's my take on this song. I know a lot of people think it's something different, but to me, it's yeah, it's a song of willful denial. Yeah. Totally. I agree with you. Also, fucking amazing. Great song. What a performance. It is a great, great song. Well, that leaves us with just the reprise. Do you say reprise or reprise? 
Reprise. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> then we get the welcome in reprise. The finale? Yeah. Yeah. But it's not the finale. I think Cabaret is the finale. Oh, in the... I'm looking at the original recording, and it's billed as finale. Oh, okay. Yeah, after sure. Cabaret. Just like uh, the song before, Cabaret should be inspirational in its like epic tone but it, it's not it's about the opposite at least in my opinion now we have this welcoming familiar song the first time mm-hmm. we don't have reprises in this no it's not like sound of music where every song gets four <laughs> reprises God. no it's not there's nothing repeated this is the only time so we for the first time we get something that should be Familiar, welcoming, because the song is... Welcome and bienvenue. Exactly. So we should have something welcoming and familiar for the first time in this movie that's just been unpleasant. Yes. An unpleasant watch, a difficult watch, an intentionally difficult watch at much of the time. So now we get this and they turn it into this haunting, nightmarish version. Yeah. That is, is scary. And then he's saying, life is beautiful. Mm-hmm. Right? And at the beginning, he tells you, come in, forget your troubles. We have no troubles here. Yeah. And then at the end, he's like, where are your troubles now? Forgotten? No. No. You've shown us all of our troubles. Yeah. And I, I love that they're asking, like, oh, yeah, everything's good now, huh? Yeah. You had such a great time. So great. And with this eerie, nightmarish music going on yeah. behind it. To And this grotesque imagery, too. There's all these shots that are... They're very intentionally unflattering and uh, unnerving. And he's just telling you, like, yeah, now all your troubles are forgotten. But, of course, we couldn't because we cannot be in this insular world of the cabaret. We have seen the outside world. We've mm-hmm. seen what happened to Sally and Brian. We've seen what's going to happen to Landauer and Fritz. Yeah. And we've seen the Nazis, right? And we, and we have the hindsight... Yes. So we know so what's, we know happening, what's happening, happening to all yeah. of these people. So, of course, no, our troubles are not forgotten, MC. Thanks yeah. for asking. Because you can't you can't forget all of that. No. You can't live in the cabaret. No, that's not how life works. That's why I think that the key messaging of this movie is to confront these things. Mm-hmm. Like, Life is a Cabaret, this song that people love to sing at show tune karaoke to be <laughs> lots of fun and like, hey, I'm the life of the party, is a call to all of you who are just going along with things. So like, oh, someone else will sort things out. That song is about, like, no, you cannot live like that. Mm-hmm. Sally is not someone to be emulated. She is a broken person. And this was a broken system and a broken world that that created all of that. So, yeah, that's why I think that it that's one of the key takeaways of the movie. Yeah, absolutely. And then if that's not enough, we then go to a mirror, which is on stage. And we just have that kind of piercing, shrill note that's being held. Yeah. And now we start going through all of the people, but they're distorted, of course, because this is a a distorted view of the world. And we see there's a lot of armbands now. There's more. You can see them really clearly. Yeah, the mirror shows who who's in the audience, and they are the Nazis now. Mm -hmm. And the first performance, there was the one. Yes. Now there's noticeably more. But when they are filming this mirror, that is, of course, putting the mirror back on us, yeah. the viewer. And it it's going back to that point of if you are passive, if you simply stand by and don't stand up against injustice, you are part of the problem. Yeah. And you feel like you have the safety of a crowd, right? When you are one of a million people, well, why is it up to me to say something? Yeah. Right? And by going and putting that mirror out there and singling people out, it's also kind of showing you like, no, that is not an excuse. You cannot hide in a crowd at a time like this. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a bizarre note to go out on, being a musical that ends with 
silent still of a distorted mirror image of a Nazi. But God, it works. It does. And that's why uh, Cabaret is my favorite musical. <laughs> I love it. It's great. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I feel like we really summed it up. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot about uh, Fosse and all of... But I think maybe we just end there. Anything else, Samantha? You uh, love this one too? I love this one too. It's a great, it's a great show. Um, I really want to see the stage production. Me too. Well, there is a 2024 revival. Well, let's go. <laughs> yeah, I just think that uh, everyone should see it. I <laughs> feel like I say that about every movie that we do, but everyone should see it. I don't know if you said that about Billy Madison. No, I don't think I did. Everyone should see that too. <laughs> I think this is an important movie. Yeah. So we will see you next week when we enter the holliest, jolliest season of the year. No, we just finished Spooktober. No. We're going the other direction. We're going to Christmas time. All right. So what are we doing next week? So next week, Indy and I will have a spoiler free holly jolly Christmas things of the week or the fortnight. And uh, then I will be revealing what we will be watching for the week after. So see you next week. Bye. Oh, Vita Zing. <laughs> I be in <laughs> Good night. Thank you.